you uh, have a cell phone or a pager, please turn it off or set it to stun. Baruch Dayan Hamet, we praise the judge of truth. Begin with a, a lovely psalm, even in this time of uh, tremendous sadness. Psalm 121. Esai enai el haharim, me ayin yavo ezri. Ezri meim adonai, ose shamayim va'aretz. Al yiten lamot raglecha, al yanum shomrecha. Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. Adonai shomrecha, adonai tzilcha al yad yeminecha. Yomam ha-shemesh lo yakeka, v'yarech balayla. Adonai shmarcha mikol ra, yishmor et nafshecha. Adonai shmar tzedcha uvoecha, me ata ba'ad olam. I lift my eyes to the mountains. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. See the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. He is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. <clears throat> the Lord will guard you from all harm. He will guard your soul. You're going and you're coming, now and forever. Death has taken our beloved Ellen Julia Nathanson. Friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence there is lamentation. In their tears there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O God, and be with them. For Ellen's love that united so many in life and which death cannot sever. For her companionship that was shared along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of her heart and mind, which brought joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance. For all of those and more, we give our thanks to God. It is a time of, of grief and sadness and once again, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures that tells us, tells us of our kinship with the Creator, in light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. Together, let us recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have a few who will be paying tribute to Ellen. First her daughter Alicia, then a friend Steve Jacobs, and friend Susie Bardi. Alicia. Um, I apologize, I'm going to read off my um, paper here because I probably can't make a whole lot of eye contact. Um, but we are gathered here to remember my mother, Ellen Nathanson. So once we learned about mom's prognosis from the doctors, I began to wonder how I would put into words all that this woman meant to me. I'm sure that many, if not all of you sitting here today, would agree that this is not an easy task. When I think of my mom, words such as caring, selfless, funny, 
fighter and survivor immediately come to mind. Family was everything to mom. She selfishly put selfish selfish selflessly put the needs of others before herself. The one constant in any of my childhood memories was mom. I remember the birthday party she planned for Max and I, the star-shaped cake pan she used to make our birthday cakes. I don't know if you ever got one of those, Max. I got a star birthday cake. Um, the summers spent at Purvis Park, where I held onto her toes as she did the backstroke. However, those special times at the pool were often interrupted by a young Max appearing from underwater and greeting us by shaking the water from his hair onto us. Um, I can never forget mom's tears of pride on the day that Max graduated from high school and college, as well as her happiness on the day he married Beth. Boy, did she dance that night away, looking absolutely beautiful in such an elegant silver dress. I actually have a picture of her dancing that day I brought with me. Um, several years later, I watched mom's love grow as she met her very first grandchild, Asher. Her love only continued to expand with the arrivals with the arrivals of Brady, Lila, and Calla due to illness. Mom was not able to be as involved in her grandchildren's lives as much as she had hoped. However, she cherished every moment with them. I can still hear her greet Lila and Calla by saying, Hey sweetie. Mom's love for Asher, Brady, Lila, and Calla was evident throughout her final days. While in the hospital, Max brought Asher and Brady for a visit. Although unable to speak, she responded with this huge expression of first surprise, then happiness. She adamantly shook her head when Max had made mention of not being able to bring Lila and Calla to the hospital due to their ages. However, once we knew that we'd have to say our goodbyes, Asher, Brady, Lila, and Calla were able to visit Mom for the last time. As we all walked into the hospital room, mom's eyes were wide open, which we hadn't seen for several days. And she looked so good, so much so that we had asked the nurse if she'd said something about family coming to visit, which she hadn't. I will always remember that moment and feel that that was a sign that our move to North Carolina over 12 years ago was meant to be. Who could forget the relationship between my mom and dad? After 46 years of marriage, they surely stood by their vows of for better or worse and death do us part. Mom constantly stayed informed of dad's happenings and attempted to advocate for him in the best way she could. For example, when dad was in short-term rehab at the same facility as mom, she'd show up in his room on a daily basis, just camp out there, and also speak to nurses on his behalf. When I said goodbye to mom a few days ago, I promised her that Max and I would always continue to take care of dad, and I know that she takes much comfort in that. Many of you know how special my relationship was with mom. She was my best friend and constant source of support. I called her my mamala, and she'd respond by calling me her baby la. As an elementary school student, having mom come to school was the best feeling. In first grade, I played Vanna White in a school function. She's still around. Prior to the performance, mom came to school to do my hair and makeup, which was the perfect task for a woman who never left the house without lipstick. She wound up doing some, um, or she wound, actually wound up doing all of the girls' hair and makeup that day that were in my class. She put together my Halloween costumes, even adding a diamond as a mole when I wanted to be Madonna. She allowed me to be her sidekick on weekends at garage sales, oftentimes with Aunt Colty and Uncle Al. And she spent, and she spent uh, spring and summer nights taking bike rides with me. We used to ride around the block on Edgerton Road, I remember, and stop in front of one house that had a huge rock on the tree lawn. I'd climb to the top and shout, King of the Mountain, while holding on to her hand. Mom's physical limitations became more pronounced while I was in middle and high school. However, despite this, she attended all of my school concerts and plays. Her diligence in seeking out scholarship opportunities and financial aid so that I could attend college with minimal debt was also like a full-time job to her. However, that didn't stop her. 
After college, I began to take on the role of caretaker to mom, something that she was quite vocal about wishing never had to, never having had to occur. Despite the con constant bumps in the road, some of which would be hard to believe actually occurred to mom, she remained positive, rarely ever complaining. I generally spent one day each week in taking mom out, in addition to visiting her several times during the week. She frequently encouraged me to take a day off for myself. I can still hear her saying, it's okay, I'll be fine. As mentioned earlier, mom was funny. Sometimes I just had to laugh because her comments or jokes were quite random, or I'd laugh because she was laughing at herself. Mom also decided most recently that she'd nickname my dog, Jack, Pedro, because apparently Jack was just too hard of a name to remember. She loved her Pedro, always asking about him. One day, she went as far as incorporating his behaviors into a voicemail. Several days prior, she had learned of me slipping down the steps over a toy of his. On, partic on this particular voicemail, she stated, don't jump on her, don't make her fall down the steps with your toy, thank you, love you, all to the tune of happy birthday. When mom met my boyfriend for the first time, within five minutes, I hear her ask, so Trey, what do you think about Alicia? I was a little surprised by her boldness because who asked that type of question after only one month of dating? While in another room, I asked her, why'd you say that? In true mom fashion, she winked at me and said, you like that, huh? She must have been quite pleased with Trey's response and enjoyed his company that evening because she ended that night um, by humming the tune of La Cucaracha. Once again, only my mom. At the end of each visit, I'd also play this game. She'd wave as I walked away, and because of her motor limitations, oftentimes her wave was the middle finger. Um, I'd then return and I'd peek into her room and I'd stand in the doorway and I would wait for her to notice me. Once she did notice me, she'd laugh. I continued to do this several times until the point that she'd finally said, get out of here. <laughs> um, having to live in a nursing facility was difficult, but mom made the best out of the situation. She was an active participant in many activities. One of her favorite activities was dressing up for Halloween as a witch. Each year, she wore a witch's hat, black clothes, and what she called a cape, which was actually just a scarf. One year, she reluctantly settled for me to polish her nails black since I was unable to find green. Along with a request for green nail polish, one day I get a call for her about needing a dress for prom. Yes, they were having a prom at the nursing facility. I wound up finding her a dress, jewelry, and even a tiara. While she was not named the prom queen that night, she will always be my queen. In closing, I'd like to read a few snippets from letters that mom had written to me. On May 1st of 2000, two weeks from finishing up my first year of college, she wrote, Daddy and I think you have matured tremendously in the last year, and we are really proud of you. And then, remember, these are the best years of your life, and the sky's the limit. If you make goals and strive to meet them, Danny and I are always here to talk. And then, in February of 2004, she sent me a Valentine's Day card. She wrote, It is truly impossible to put into words how much you mean to us. With all of our trials and tribulations, you're always there for us. Believe me, we know it's hard for you but we do appreciate your need for independence and time away from us. You have proven yourself to be a star in every sense of the word, in school and at work, in thick and through thin. You should carry with yourself every day a self-confidence, knowing that you're the best and showing the world that your beauty radiates from deep inside and out. Anyone who knows you will quickly see and feel that life is hard, but you know you will make it no matter what. Mom was right. Things were really hard for me, but I made it and I will continue to do so. I will always admire mom's strength and know where I certainly get it from. It is an honor to find myself so much like her. Thank you for allowing me to stand before all of you as I share some of my precious memories of my mother. Mom made a lasting impression on all that knew her. Mom, you will be missed more than words can say, but I know that you will always be with me, 
and I want you to finally be able to rest in peace. I love you. Those uh, beautiful words, let us say amen, like a prayer. Alicia, the words that your mom wrote in your Valentine are very true. The rabbi mentioned precious memories, and I thought I would share uh, some memories of mine that might give uh, Asher and, um, oh, I'm gonna try to remember names of grandkids, I'm sorry. Asher, Brady, Lila, and Kala. They get it right? I'm going to share some memories that'll give you a glimpse into what your grandma was like when she was young. Not quite as young as you two ladies, but maybe, uh, Brady's age, Asher's age. I met your mom in 1966, and it was a New Year's Eve, and neither Bill nor I had dates. So we decided to go out and go to a party, and we were in my dad's car. He let me borrow it. And we were driving up Cedar Road at a stoplight just below Cedar Center. When a car pulled up next to us, and it was Bobby Stern. Now Bob and I and Bill went to high school together. And in the back seat of Bob's car were two giggly teens. It was Ellen and Sue Barty. And I looked at Bob and I said, hey, what are you guys doing? And he said, well, not much. We're just driving around. What are you doing? And I said, well, Bill and I are going to a party. You want to come with us? And he said, yeah. So we pulled into a gas station, gave them directions, and went on to a party that wound up in Shaker. It was at a big house. And that was where Bill met Ellen. And that is the first time I met Sue Barty. And we just all seemed to hit it off. And uh, since that time, we, uh, we have stayed in touch, which I'm uh, very thankful for. I remember going to your mom's apartment at the corner of Superior and I think it's Mayfield Road. And I remember uh, Ellen's dad his name was Arthur, but I used to call him Joe, uh, I think to irritate him. We, we got along fine, but he had a very sarcastic sense of humor, as did I, and that made for some very interesting interactions. One time, Ellen decided she was going to go to uh, Oak Park, Michigan to visit Sue, and I said, hey, I'm going to come hang around. Would it be okay if I come with you? And she said, sure. So we took a ride out to um, the Shoreway. There used to be an airline terminal out there with Wright Airlines. And I remember the round trip ticket to Detroit cost $15. And it was a two engine plane. It was a very rough ride. Ellen happened to get sick and I laughed at her. And it was at that point that I think Sue and Ellen and I and other friends in Oak Park and even here in um, Cleveland, like Gwen, uh, we used to get together, go to parties together. And I have some very, very fond memories of your grandma. And she was a beautiful, beautiful lady. And I'll never forget her. And her spirit will always be with me. Thank you. Well, I guess I can't tell any of the stories anybody else told, because they're all true and whatever, but I'm Susie Barty, and um, first I wanted to read something 
Um, I actually heard somebody read this at, a, at a, another funeral that I was at, and it just really <laughs> struck me. And so um, I don't know if any of you heard it before, but it's called um, the, da the Dash by Linda Ellis. <coughs> I don't know if I'm talking through the microphone. Can everybody hear me? I don't yeah. know. Oh, put the mic up. Is that better? Yeah. More and more? They can hear me. Oh, okay. Steve, can you hear me now? Okay. Sorry. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came her date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. 1964 to 1994. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, Remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, would your life's actions with, I'm sorry, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? And I have to say that in Ellen's case, I think that she just li lived her life to the best of the ability that she could and she just loved everything and she enjoyed everything and she liked to be with people and she liked to do things she liked to go around she liked to speak French with people she liked to sing all the time and um, she was not a complainer I mean she had a hard life but she never complained about the the cards that she was dealt you know she just she just went and 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 just lived her life and, and did the things Ellen and I um, Steve was talking about when we all when we all first met, but Ellen and I, our parents um, were in the Holocaust in Hungary, and then after the war, they uh, were all living in a displaced persons camp in Germany, and that's where they all met. And my parents actually introduced Ellen's parents to each other, and made made that match. And both families came to the United States, settled in different places. We settled in Michigan. They settled in Ohio. But when Ellen and I were 12 years old, her family came to visit my family. And we just bonded. We just hit it off right away. And we became family to each other. And we've always been close. And then, as Steve was telling you, we randomly one night were riding around with, uh, with Ellen's brother, Bobby, and ran into Steve and Bill. And so, uh, and I think, I think Ellen maybe knew you guys in passing from before or whatever, but I, I don't know how well or whatever, but we met, all met that night, and uh, we just we just all bonded, and Ellen, of course, ended up marrying Bill, and then we all bonded, and Steve and Ellen and I, I don't know, I kind of think of us as a three musketeers kind of thing. We've always been in contact and always been with each other, and when Ellen and Bill got married then to me that became my family too and then when they have kids with Max and Alicia it became my family too so but um, I'd have to say um, same kinds of things Ellen loved to laugh first of all she would say kind of like random thing funny things uh, just just randomly or whatever but the funniest thing was when she would say something and then she would start laughing at it and then we would start laughing at her laughing, and then she'd laugh harder, and then we'd laugh harder. So <laughs> we'd all be laughing all around. So, um, and um, what else? I, um, I just, 
she, she, yeah, she was just a caring, wonderful, sweet, lovely person. I mean, she, she always took care of other people. She, she put other people first. She took care of her parents. They, they were not well, and she took care of them. And she took care of Bill when, when he was not well. And then she took care of Max and Alicia. Sometimes she'd have two, three jobs to keep the family going. And she did whatever was necessary. And she just, she took care of everybody. And she, like I say, she just, she was not a complainer. And she just tried to enjoy everything that she had. And I will, um, I will miss her very, very much. She was a very special person. So um, I hope that wherever she is, she's up free, running around, speaking French, and singing her heart out. So. And so to all of those words spoken as a prayer, let us say amen. We gather a saddened throng to reminisce and to pay our respects to the memory of your dear Ellen Nathanson. Ellen is, uh, was many things and is many things, and you've heard them, many of them. And in addition to, to those things, uh, when we gathered yesterday to talk about her, when you spoke about your dear mother and wife, I was reminded of a, of a teaching in the Talmud. It, it speaks of a saintly rabbi who was constantly pondering the great mysteries of life and the inscrutable secret of life beyond the grave. And so one day this rabbi was walking through a town market, engrossed in his ponderings, and he came into direct spiritual communication with Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi. Elijah the prophet, uh, the one we invite to every Passover Seder, the forerunner of the messianic time of universal brotherhood, sisterhood, and peace. And so this rabbi asks Elijah, will any of these people in the market square today share the bliss of the world to come with me when they have died and I have died? And Elijah points to some people on the far side of the market square and says they will. And Elijah looks, and it's just a couple of simple performers, the Talmud says, um, just performing and entertaining for people. And the rabbi said, these simple performers will be my companions in the world to come. What merits do they possess? And Elijah answered, they have joyful fun-loving spirits that brighten up the hearts of others. And that was Ellen. Joyful, fun-loving spirits. Have, have smiley faces on the tie. Just for her. Her parents of blessed memory, Arthur and Susan. Her brother, Bobby, of blessed memory. After the family came to America, uh, and then Richmond, Virginia, and then Cleveland. Um, she went to Cleveland Heights High School, graduated in 1969. She was a bright young lady and a hard worker. And she graduated very, very close to the top of her class. And back then, Heights had, you know, I mean, more than a thousand people in a class. It was, uh, it's quite a feat. She went to Oberlin for a year and then went to Cleveland State. And William Nathanson and Ellen Stern met at the high school party you uh, you heard about. Uh, Bill went to Cuyahoga Community College and then to Cleveland State, and they continued to date. And although Bill says, I dated other, uh, other girls at the same time, but my heart was always with Ellen, and I loved her. They were married September 11th, 1971, at Silver's Temple by Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver of blessed memory. And they shared a loving and devoted marriage of more than 46 years and blessed with family. Many, many extended family, a couple of children, you know their names, grandchildren, you've heard their names too. So Beth and the grandchildren sent an email 
and recalled of Ellen. I love Grandma's singing voice. I love how she was beautiful and caring, and I love her smile. I love how even though she had trouble getting around, she was always happy. I love how she gave us kisses and left lipstick on our cheeks. I love when we went to restaurants like Bagels Plus. I love how she was always happy to see us and would sing the Nutter Butter song. I love how she always had multiple colors of lipstick and it matched every outfit. I love her purses and earrings. I loved when I interviewed her and she told me all about her life during the Holocaust. I love how she always had a smile and a joking personality and she was always singing and having a good time. Early Saturday morning, which is Shabbat, overnight, Friday night to Saturday, she breathed her last. And now there's no more deterioration or pain. There's just rest and wholeness and peace. Shabbat is a day of rest, a time of rest and peace, and her soul is at peace. We believe that her soul is returning to God to be with the souls of her dear relatives and friends and the ancestors of our people. And we learn this in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7. The dust returns to the earth as it was. The spirit returns to God who gave it. And one day, all of us will join our loved ones in Olam Haba, the world to come. It's actually a time. This is a place right here. This is a place. Cemetery is a place. That's just for the body. The spirit returns to God. And you will be together with your loved ones in that spiritual realm. The family is allowing us to send along a couple of uh, little old Haggadot, Passover Haggadahs, with her in the casket and sending along a, a little talus that was given to me as well. And it's a mitzvah to do so because it's a religious obligation to escort the body of a loved one to its final resting place and also to provide respectful burial for holy books and ritual objects of our tradition. We give thanks to God for this gift of life. It has been an arduous journey and she with grace and with a tremendous stick to itiveness, right? It's a word, you know, she she was very uh, very committed to doing as she wanted to do and she worked very hard and she was diligent. It's a, a fine example for us, for each of us, for whom uh, the challenges may be less arduous, you know, less fetching, more doing. And so we say with tears in our eyes, words from the first chapter of the book of Job. Adonai Natan, Vadonai lakach, yehi shem Adonai mevarach. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. O se shalom bim romav, u yaase shalom aleinu, ve al kohol Yisrael, ve imru. Yahse Shalom, Yahse Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, the Alcohol Yisrael. Yahse Shalom, Yahse Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, the Alcohol Yisrael. May God who causes peace to reign in the high heavens. Cause peace to rain down upon us, upon all Israel, and upon the soul of our dearly departed Ellen Nathanson. And let us say, Amen. Please rise for El Malay Rachamim. Into your care, O God, we entrust the spirit of our dear Ellen Julia Nathanson. For you keep faith with your children in death as in life. 
Sustain us that we may meet with serenity the mysteries that lie ahead, knowing that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, O God, are with us, a loving friend in whom we put our trust. You are the light of our life, our hope in eternity. El male rachamim shochen b'amromim hametze menucha nechona tachat kanfe hashchina im kedoshim utohorim kezor haraki amasirim. Et nishmat el nathanson shalachal olama baal harachamim yasti reha besetekin afav leolamim vayitzro bitzro hachayim et nishmata. Adonai hu nacharata v'tanu ach b'shalom al mishkava v'nomar Amen Compassionate God, Eternal Spirit of the Universe Grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to our dear Alan Nathanson, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let her find refuge in the shadow of your wings, and let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. May she rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. The funeral director will now come in and give us instructions as we are going to go to Mount Olive Cemetery and afterward well he'll come in and give us directions one